1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not merely being human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. May God richly bless the reading and the hearing of his word. Well, good morning. Grace to you and peace from our God and Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It is good. It's great the Bible is to gather together. Here we are in the presence of the Holy Spirit enjoying the fellowship of the saints. So it is a treasure to get together and we come to hear from Christ. So we do that as we turn to this word we just heard read. Uh, but I would like to ask, just certainly at least for my own soul, but for all of us, we need the Spirit's help, don't we? So we've been studying in Rome or in 1 Corinthians here. So let's ask for his help just once more to prepare our hearts to receive the word. Almighty God and most merciful Father, we humbly submit ourselves and fall down before your majesty, asking you if it were possible from the bottom of our hearts that the seed of your word to be sown among us would take such deep root that neither the burning heat of persecution could cause it to wither nor the thorny cares of this life choke it, but that as a seed sown in good ground, it would bring forth thirty, sixty, or a hundredfold, as your heavenly wisdom has appointed. This we pray for the glory of Jesus Christ and His church. Amen. Amen. I was adolescent or teen years in one's life or in one's home, if you're the parent of a teenager or of a couple, uh, can be rather challenging. I think it's defined or known by this. Uh, but not just challenging, I would use the words disorienting, uh, perhaps confusing, or I love this one, just sounds great, discombobulating. Uh, we're so off-center, we're off-balance, as we are young people growing up, figuring out what does it mean that I'm becoming an adult, and then as adults, shepherding young people in our homes, figuring out what does it mean that my child's becoming an adult. It's a different world to have that squeaky-voiced person in your house moving from a childhood to adulthood. And frankly, the transition is just not always smooth, to say the least. It, it very much is a maturation process. It's not, you can't just flip a switch. Uh, that's not how it worked for me anyway, and it's not how it works for any of us. It is a process of growth, of maturing. And the way it goes, uh, young people don't mature at the same rate. And I don't just mean if we compare this young person with that young person, but even the young person himself or herself, all of them do not mature at the same rate. Parts of them mature much faster than others. So take, for example, the physical body. The stature, physique, can develop faster than evidently the teen brain. Their body outruns their brain very quickly in the whole maturation process. That is, in other words, he starts to look like a man. Have you had that scenario in your home? You start hearing other man voices suddenly in your house. Where did that come from? He sounds like a man. He looks like a man. He increasingly has the strength of a man. But his mind can be slower to catch up like a man's. In other words, teens oftentimes can look more and more like adults but they still think quite a bit like children. They're immature. 
And that's normal for young people. It's part of the maturation process. Evidently, though, or surely, frustrations rise because these young people who are growing into adulthood, they want more freedoms that come with adulthood. I can finally do this or do that, right? And I know, to be clear, I mean, I have teens in my home right now. I get that. But it's like I'm putting, I'm remembering back when I was that kid, pressing on my parents. Like, I'm totally able to go do this. I'm 17 and a half. I mean, come on. I'm basically all grown up now. And yet, all the while, the teen may have a really hard time, though they're pressing for all those freedoms, uh, following through on all of the corresponding grown-up grown up responsibilities that go with those freedoms. In other words, they might look like adults, but are they mature? And just frankly, as we've noted, many times they're not. Uh, but most young people, they do get there. Praise God, right? And they start doing this thing that we have now made a verb, adulting. Which, looking it up, the definition for adulting, according to Oxford Dictionary, going from memory here, is that you're doing normal, everyday adult tasks. Like, that's some great accomplishment. Wow, you've made it. You can pay a bill. Congratulations. But there does come a time where their maturity catches up, their life maturity, mental maturity, starts to catch up with their physical maturity. But again, it's a process, and that requires patience from everyone, But that growth process is normal. But what isn't normal is for people to stay in that childish phase and they never grow out of it. That is, on the one, a physical tragedy, a waste of physical strength and aptitude. But more than that, as we turn it to a spiritual level, it's a spiritual danger. That there are people who, perhaps on the outside, look very mature. Maybe they've grown up in the church a long time, and you figure, well, they've been growing and growing this whole time, and so by now, surely they are great, strong Christians. Look at the white hair. But maybe not. Maybe they're actually spiritual adolescents. They look like adults on the outside, but on the inside, they're actually spiritual babes. They've stunted in their growth. And this word from Corinthians is, and now it's time to grow up. Because their spiritual immaturity, what we see in Corinthians, it's not only a harm to them as an an individual, but it's a risk even to the whole church. And so back to Corinthians, what marks their spiritual immaturity? Well, 1 Corinthians 3 begins to tell us, and it's just simply this, and this is probably the root of all of it, frankly. Their spiritual immaturity, and and what's the problem in Corinth right now that we're dealing with in these opening four chapters, really? Their divisions, their factions. What accounts for this? Well, they preoccupy themselves with man's abilities, human capacities, the human abilities and success and contributions. They're focused on what we can do. And so this word Corinthians is, well, now it's time to spiritually grow up. That spiritual maturity being focused on you, being focused on man, being focused on what a man can do, it's time to spiritually grow up and have faith, right? Set your focus on God. Namely, because we see here, He's the one who gets the growth. He's the one who does the work. It's not in the work of men. And the church, as we've been talking in Corinth, right, what is the church built around? How does it form? It's formed at the cross, And that word of Christ, that is what brings people to Jesus, and that must be what will hold us together. And any time that we are being preoccupied with men, we are at risk of compromising that unity, fracturing the church. And so we need to grow up and have an unwavering focus on Him. And so that looks like really two commands, really a put off and a put on that we see covered in these first nine verses here. What does it look like to spiritually grow up? Well, in the first place, you got to put off And you need to stop your factious rivalries. Stop your factious rivalries. Verses 1 to 4. This is the first step the Corinthians need to take towards spiritual maturity. And they need to stop overemphasizing, overesteeming men, what men can do. Stop giving them so much credit because when you focus, preoccupy yourself with them, surely you will cause divisions and factions and rifts in the church. And what Paul's making clear, and they're inclined to do that, to have and pick their favorites and champion their favorite preacher. Why are they so driven to that? Well, frankly, because they're spiritually immature. 
Now, that might come as a bit of surprise to hear that they have this uh, accusation of spiritual immaturity because of how much, you remember two weeks ago, Paul was waxing eloquent on how blessed the Corinthians are along with all Christians. Remember this? Even look to the end of chapter 2. He was highlighting what we have as Christians that the world doesn't have. We have wisdom because we have God's Spirit. He says even at the end of verse 16 in chapter 2, you have the very mind of Christ. I mean, this is it. You, you have the Holy Spirit, and, and namely, you have the mind of Christ to understand the gospel, right? That's what we've been dealing with so far in Corinthians. It's by the Spirit's help that you, the, the blinders have been taken off. And, and you can see the cross for what it is. What does the cross tell us? It tells you that you're a great sinner who's committed great offenses against God, and that means you're in great big trouble before Him. But it also tells us that Christ came for our sins. He came to bear them, to be punished for them, to be cursed for them, and to rise from the dead. And that's what has happened at the cross and now the empty tomb. And believers, we get this. He died for me. That was for me. He rescued me. I'm forgiven now. And it's the Spirit that's given you eyes to see. That is true about every Christian. The Spirit's work in our heart to help us to see. That's what really makes you a Christian. But what immediately becomes clear as we turn here into chapter 3, though the Corinthians have that, uh, they don't live like it. Though they have that, they don't enjoy yet a robust spiritual health. Rather, they have been stunted in their spiritual growth, most evidently. Because though they have received the Holy Spirit, Paul laments and says, but I can't even talk to you on a spiritual level. That's how stunted you are in your spiritual growth. Look at verse 1 of chapter 3 now. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh. Again, you have the mind of Christ, the end of chapter 2. You have the Holy Spirit, but I can't even talk to you on that level. Why? Because you're acting like people of the flesh. Now, what is this? Some translations even have here carnal or just the word fleshly. Whatever it is, if you know a little bit of the Bible, it doesn't sound good. Often, this term fleshly or carnal is set in contrast to the Holy Spirit. And that's what we see here. Again, I can't address you as spiritual people. I have to talk to you as fleshly people. But elsewhere, he pits these influences of the flesh and the spirit, often Paul does. And and they're in opposition. They're against one another. And I think most famously, it's probably this text that you're familiar with if it's coming to your mind, but it's Galatians chapter 5. You don't have to turn there. You can Um, but just to listen. But if it's not coming to your mind what Galatians 5 is about, it's the text about the fruit of the Spirit. What does the Spirit produce in your life? Well, he contrasts that with the works of the flesh, right? And they are, are polar opposites. Listen to this. Here's what the flesh looks like, that old sinful self, that part of you, when it's having influence in your life, what does it produce out of you? Here it is, Galatians 5, 19 and following. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. You can spot these a mile away. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, and all those things. You see those? They're like, yeah, 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 those are horrible. Of course, those are people dominated by the flesh. But then he goes on. Enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, Envy, drunkenness, orgies, and then he just adds, and things like these. This is no exhaustive list in case your sin didn't get mentioned. It's mentioned. That's contrasted. That's what the flesh, our old sinful self, produces out of us. That's contrasted with, of course, what the Spirit does. It's the very opposite. Here's Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Right? The very opposite of what the flesh produces, because they're at odds with one another. Actually, just earlier in chapter 5, verse 17 of Galatians, he says this, For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. And then he adds, For these are opposed to one another. It's a picture. There's a battle line, and they're at war. And you got the flesh camp and the spirit camp, and they're at war in the believer's heart. 
right? Get this. Before you came to Christ, before you got the Holy Spirit, you were just dominated by those desires of the flesh. Paul talks about it in other places. You were enslaved to them. But now, by faith, by the Holy Spirit, there's at least a battle going on. And so the Christian, we should be, as our Christian life goes on, right? We should be more and more characterized, defined by that fruit of the Spirit. We should be growing as opposed to being characterized more and more by the deeds of the flesh. But here's the thing to take us back to Corinth. They're not growing. They have the Spirit, but evidently they're not using Him you might say, or being under his influence. They're stuck in their old worldly ways. Their spiritual growth has been very slow, if not nearly absent. And so absent, you might even think initially, are they even Christians? Are they Christians at all? Well, back to verse 1, back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1, that is. He says, evidently they are, because he says, but I, brothers... Could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh. And then he adds, as infants in Christ. So there's a little saving grace there, isn't it? They might be babes, but they're babes in Jesus. But is this okay? Though there's some saving grace there, is it okay to remain spiritually infantile? And this is worth addressing, and we got to take a moment here, because some have taken from this verse and developed a whole theology called being a carnal Christian. And the tricky part is, and this is true with almost every errant bit of theology, ah, there's a kernel of truth in it. And there's a kernel of truth that Paul talks about someone who's living carnally as a Christian and somebody who's not. But some have taken that teaching and they use it as a use it as a refuge or as an explanation or a label for somebody that says, yes, I believe in Jesus, but I won't make him Lord of my life. I believe in Jesus, but I don't want to follow him. I don't want to do what he tells me. I don't want to repent for my sin. As if then, because you say you believe, oh, that's fine. That's not ideal. You really should make Jesus the Lord of your life but you're still going to heaven. But whatever that idea is, call it carnal Christian, call it whatever you want, Jesus calls it a false gospel. Scripture cuts against this notion in every way. In fact, you know this. Jesus, as He shows up on the scene and He's going to start His ministry, what was His opening call? But it was a call to what? Repent! Repent! Repent and believe the gospel, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And Jesus warns later, remember at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, if you were one of those who is content to listen to what Jesus says, such that you will even call him your Lord, but will not do what he says, he warns there in Matthew 7 and tells us, oh, you're going to have a rude awakening on the judgment day. Lord, Lord, did we not? Lord, Lord, did we not? To which he will say, Matthew 7, verse 23, I never knew you. Depart from me. And then he adds this at the end, the defining feature about these folks. You workers of lawlessness. So the point's this. Even what we're dealing with with Paul and all of these matters of carnal Christian or not, if you're content in your sin, that's a very disturbing and very dangerous place to be for your soul. Such that if you can continue in your sin without interruption, either because your conscience by the Holy Spirit's not stopping you or the Lord's loving discipline's not stopping you, chances are, despite whatever you say, Lord, Lord, and I believe you have not really believed on Jesus in any kind of genuine New Testament way. Because you're not being changed. Like back to Galatians 5, there's no war in your soul. You're just dominated by the flesh because there's no spirit there to stop him, so to speak. In other words, if you're living entirely in the flesh, it's either because one, you don't have the Holy Spirit, or two, and maybe you sense that even this very morning, is that you're just rejecting his influence in your life. Either way, that's not a good place to be, and you're being called out of it this very moment. 
This is carnality, fleshly living. And back to Corinthians, it's what defines spiritual immaturity. And it's gross spiritual immaturity. It's offensively childish. So to look back now, 1 Corinthians 3, because there's a point to act like a child. There's a time for everything. There's a time to act like a baby. And you know when it is? It's when you are one. Verse 2, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And that's understandable. Babies need milk, right? You don't fault your newborn because they don't have a taste for filet mignon or in and out burger. Though they're still crazy. That's all I'm saying. Babies want milk. They need milk. But when a 24-year-old man with facial hair who identifies as a baby and wears a diaper and only drinks milk, what is that? Gross. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. But here's the kicker. And even now you're not ready for it. You're supposed to be maturing by now. Putting away these works of the flesh. But he looks at you, now on into verse 3, but you're still on in the flesh. You're not maturing. You're not putting away the fleshly thinking and control. You're not living by the Spirit. Well, in what way are they not living by the Spirit? In what way are they dominated by the deeds of the flesh? How do they need to grow up? Verse 3, for you're still of the flesh. Let me explain, he says, for while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? But you see it there, kind of right in the middle of verse 3, those two terms. They define here what immature thinking fleshly thinking looks like, jealousy and strife. Now, when you think of spiritual immaturity, are those the two things that come up in your mind, jealousy and strife? When you think of being dominated by the flesh, are those the things that come to your mind that might surface in the church, jealousy and strife? Because we go back to Galatians 5, where we get listed out the deeds of the flesh, and this is what we hear, right? We saw this. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Again, you can spot them a mile away. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, sure. But these other ones, they are as equally works and deeds of the flesh. Enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, and divisions. And isn't that the issue in Corinth? The issue in Corinth of their factiousness stems from their spiritual maturity, which is being, in other words, dominated by fleshly, worldly desires. That is, when you see enmity, strife, dissensions, fits of anger, when you see that come out of your life, you know what you can be sure? That didn't come from the Holy Spirit. And if it didn't come from the Spirit, guess what it came from? You and your old wicked self. It's carnal, it's wrong, it's immature, it's worldly, it's fleshly. But the book of James even captures these terms and goes farther than that. It's not just those things, it's all of that, it's one more. It's devilish. Listen to this. This is James chapter 3. It's striking because he's also talking about wisdom, which we've been, of course, dealing with in Corinthians. But he says this. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it is earthly, unspiritual, and then he adds, demonic. You want to know where that jealousy and selfish ambition and strife come from? They come from the devil setting it on fire in your heart. Whoa, this sounds really bad. Yeah. Probably worse than we think. It's gross spiritual immaturity. But what will probably surprise us when you think, again, as you came in here, what's the mark of real spiritual immaturity? Is it these things? Because you might be surprised to find out you're not as far from baby Christianity as you thought you were. Look at verse 4. See, he personifies. 
He puts into words what their jealousy and strife looks like, what their demonic kind of thinking looks like, what their fleshly thinking looks like when it comes out of their mouth. And what does it sound like? Verse 4. For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, he adds, are you not being merely human, as in unspiritual, ungodly, carnal, fleshly? What does it look like? It looks like picking your favorite preacher and being enamored with his gifts and style and leadership. It means then, correspondingly, discrediting the leadership of others because they're not your guy or they don't say it quite like your guy or your most anointed preacher, leader, discipler. It means rallying behind one man and ignoring his faults, even his weaknesses or his misplaced emphases, and you take his hobby horses as your own. It's the great concerns for the church. And what's the problem with that? As he ends, are you not merely being human? And what does that mean? What does he mean by that? He means you're being just like the world that doesn't have the Holy Spirit. You're acting like the rest of Corinth. You're acting like the rest of Richmond. You're acting like the rest of America. We're just so quick to line up behind certain leaders and we just start parroting their talking points from pastors to politicians to talking heads and podcasters. More than we're driven by the actual truth. And if you want just a proof of this, that this has infected our whole society, I mean, just look at our political scene, right? You know, what's, what's the ringing regret? I mean, pretty much you ask any American on any side of the aisle, and it's that there's all this tribalism going on. It's all this factiousness. We can't even talk about principles together. We just talk past one another, and we all lament it. And so what do we do? We tow the party line instead of doing what's good or right. And again, both sides of the aisle do this, politically speaking. But what we're finding is that Christians do this too, right within the church. Such that what can you have? You got your MacArthur camp, right? I'm a MacArthur. Look at my study Bible. It's got his name on it. Okay. You got the Paul Washer camp. You got the John Piper camp. And you got the... Tim Keller camp and the Alistair Begg camp. And wh what's going on within those camps? We end up talking a lot about a guy, a particular man and his giftedness and his teaching and his way to say it and his influence. And can't you believe how many people across the world listen to the radio and hear him? And then what happens too, you catch yourself defending him. Even when maybe he didn't say it quite right. You defend his exa exaggerations. You defend his overstatements. And you know what's going to really happen then? It's going to be factious, and it's going to divide the church. Why? Because you're making as if the Christian life is focused on a person that isn't Jesus Christ. And it's more than, as we've seen, spiritually infantile. It's spiritually demonic. And I think this can catch us by surprise. It's a big blind spot, or can be, because we think we're mature, because we have taken steps. We have grown a little bit. And again, I think this is what, you know, a young person, an adolescent, as they're just looking at life, they, they don't look like a child anymore. They don't sound like a child. And yet, not everything's gone up to speed yet. And I think we can be like that. We can make these great, these great growth spurts, spiritually speaking. And maybe we were helped along by listening to this guy on the radio or we read this book and I love Christ more. Yes, I know him more. Yes. But then we think it's because of him and not the God that he preached. We start to esteem the man more than the God that he preaches. It becomes less about Christ and more about the man or the teacher or the disciple or the women's conference speaker, whoever. And I think of our affinity for how God used that person. We, we want to share that with everybody. you got to love him like I do. you got to love this guy. And here's where the danger, I think especially for us and our camp, whatever we want to call it, okay? You know, we present somebody. We're just going to use the MacArthur Study Bible. You give somebody a MacArthur Study Bible. You know, maybe it's in a CC group. 
that's not made up of all Grace Bible people, or, or you met some other Christian, and they're, they're struggling with, in their discipleship, and you're like, ah, oh, I got the perfect thing for you. I got this book, and it's the Bible. It's the best one, but it's got all these notes in the bottom, and they help you so much. I've so grown spiritually. Let me share this with you. And they're like, thank you. But that's it. It's like nonplussed. They're like, I appreciate it. And you're like, no, no, I'm serious. Like, there is like spiritual magic almost in those notes. Like, memorize them and stuff. And they're, they're like, I'm sure, thanks. I'll, I'll get to it when I can. And then the trouble is, in our mind, we start having thoughts like, ah, oh, I see. They're just not mature enough yet. Oh, when they really get serious about walking with the Lord, they'll thank me for that MacArthur Study Bible. Then they'll be spiritually mature enough. But you know, what is this text telling us? That attitude is the very opposite of spiritual maturity. Because it's attaching something to a particular man or teaching or ministry. That's the sign of spiritual immaturity. It stems from a carnal attitude driven by favoritism, factions, jealousy, strife, fits of anger, the kind of stuff that divides the church. So, what's the word? Spiritually, we got to grow up, right? Stop your factious rivalries. Stop being so preoccupied with a certain man or a preacher, counselor, whoever, and their teaching and abilities. Because otherwise the church will split. The church was formed and made to focus on Christ and his cross. Not any man who shows us that. So that's the put off. Stop your factious rivalries. Stop preoccupying yourself about what men can do. And then second, the put on is you got to reset your focus on God who actually does the work. That's where he turns next and he says, let me get your eyes off us servants and get your eyes on the God who actually brings the growth. That will unite his church. That is what spiritual maturity looks like. And it begins right away because he's going to put these great servants of God, Paul and Apollos, in their proper place. And what are they? They're just servants. Servants. Look at verse 5. What then is Apollos and what is Paul? They're just servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each Notice the Lord's even the one in charge of what their particular roles were. But right from the start, you get a sense Paul is bringing us down to earth with our high estimation of Paul and even Apollos there in Corinth. Because notice, he doesn't start it off and say, and this is, let me say it this way. He doesn't start it off and say, who is Apollos or who is Paul? But he uses this term what in the most accurate Greek manuscripts here. What is Paul and what is Apollos? Why? Because it's not about the person. Like we should love those ministers who have been faithful and they've given us the gospel, but it's not about them as people. He's looking at the what, their role, what they do. And he's telling the Corinthians, maybe telling us, oh, and you've esteemed them far too highly. No, even as I just put it, you know, we, we should love the, those who have ministered to us the Word of God. But Paul's point here is even, tut, tut, just slow down on that thought for a second. Who is the one who ministered to you the Word of God? Was it Paul? Was it Apollos? Or was it God? And before you say yes, like because often it works like that, where it seems like both, it's not here. Paul's point is, it's not me, it's not Apollos, it's only God. We're just servants, tools, instruments in the hands of our Redeemer. What power does an axe have until the lumberjack takes it and wields it and uses it? What usefulness does a blender or mixer or frying pan have until the cook picks it up and starts to use it to make a marvelous meal? The point is the credit goes to the chef, goes to the lumberjack, not to the tool. And so it is whoever ministers the Word of God to you. From that celebrated internet preacher to the woman here who led an excellent Bible study that you grew by. What are they but instruments used by God to bless you? You were blessed because of God, not because of the tool. Because that's the point Paul makes as he turned to verse 6. 
God's the one who makes all this work. Verse 6, I planted even. Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. In verse 9, in just a moment, he's going to fill out this metaphor, and he calls the Corinthian church God's own field. It's God's field. He's put different workers there, sure, that have different jobs and responsibilities, Paul, Apollos, and others. Paul was the planter. Paulus was the cultivator, watering the land. And then the crops sprung up out of this field. And who's to thank for that? Well, I mean, Paul was the first one to actually bring them the gospel. But if that wasn't coupled with Apollos' work of watering, what good would have come of it? And similarly, if... or. Related to that, if Paul hadn't first planted the seed, Apollos could have been watering all day and night and it would have done nothing. Each has an important role to play, yes, between the sower and the cultivator. But in the end, what's his point? God gives the growth. It's God's work. This is key. Because what this means is that neither Paul's planting or Apollos' watering are determinative. That means they're not the root. They're not the cause. They're not the reason that you grew. It was God, period. He's the grower. So he gets the credit. You got to see what this does because this greatly relativizes the importance of whoever the sowers or the waterers are. That means the preachers, the disciples, the evangelists, ministers, counselors, all of them. Because what are they or what is any of their work if God's not in it? He tells us, verse 7, So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. Read that again, right? Verse 7, So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, Do you notice there's negatives there? So you could flip it around and look at like this. The one who plants and the one who waters is nothing. That's what that means. They're nothing. If God's not in it, it is nothing. And trust me, God doesn't even need us to do it. Why were you converted to, say, listening to John MacArthur on the radio instead of David Jeremiah? Why was your child's heart finally changed by that great conference speaker or the youth pastor's talk when you'd been sowing the same truths in their heart? It seemed like every day, especially at 11 p.m. when they come in your room and you're trying to go to bed. Why is it? The Lord assigned it to be that way. Because that's when God said, now the growth will happen. And so that means it had far less to do with MacArthur's superior ability to explain it. It had to do with the God who mercifully broke in to a hardened heart. So why are we then so enamored with the teachers? Why are we so taken with preachers and influencers and counselors and books and authors? Why are we tempted to give them so much credit, credit that they can't take? That's a mark of our spiritual maturity if that's us. Because on the surface, as he goes on, Paul's point here is to call out all these various camps of fanboys and followers of these favorite preachers. And he's, he's trying to get them to realize something. So it's like he's calling to them. He's saying, okay, you Pauline enthusiasts, you guys love Paul the preacher. And they're like, yeah, we love his cool logic. We love his sacrificial spirit. He's been in prison for the gospel Paul's the best. And they're like, yeah. Can you imagine that fury? I can. I can see it on their faces. Okay. Or then we got the Apollos crowd. Oh, we love his passionate preaching. Oh, his logic and rhetoric. We love Paul. I mean, Apollos. No one's like him. And everybody's like, yeah, Apollos. And then it's like Paul's in the middle saying, guys, it's not a competition. It's not who's trying to sell more books or get larger donations from Corinth. They have the same goal. We're going the same direction. Look at verse 8 then. 
He who plants and he who waters are one. And each will receive his wages according to his labor. He's saying, Apollos and I were partners in kingdom work. But it's God's work. you got to get that. It's not ours. And it's about God's purpose among the Corinthians. They were not working for their praise, but working with God for His. Again, notice verse 9. For we are God's fellow workers. It's not a competition. It's not a competition between desiringgod.org and then gty.org to see who can get the most downloads this week. It's not a competition, even in this town, about which church can have the most seats filled or the most services with the biggest budgets and the largest attendance numbers. We should all be working for the same thing, right? God's purpose to make disciples of all nations here in Richmond, because that's where we're starting from. And that's our mission, to hold up Christ high and have the nations bow and love Him. And so that means we need to rejoice when that's going on, even when it's not right here. Or at least it's happening more there than it is here. Praise God for His mercy, that He breaks in on sinners' hearts. But I think, frankly, our big temptation at grace towards spiritual immaturity in this way is that we start to judge these other churches, even for the way God's blessed them. (laughs) Oh, well, did you see on Easter they had 16 services? Well, of course they have so many people coming because they water it down. Yeah, that's why. They don't disciple. They're spiritually weak and immature. That's why people love to flock to them, but not us. Not the few faithful, chosen Calvinists here, all six of us. But you see, that's the attitude of the immature one, isn't it? So we got to be careful. Got to be on guard, don't we? Now, God, we're going to look next week. And, And there are things to talk about, about being faithful in ministry. And admittedly, not every church is equally faithful. And we're trying to be as faithful as we can be, as many other churches are. It's not about success, it's about faithfulness. We'll look at that a lot next week, Lord willing. But the point here is this, God is the kingdom builder, the gospel worker. It's not us. We are just coming into His wake coming into his field to work wherever he tells us and how he tells us. Because this is the striking that's, or the emphasis that's so striking in verse 9. In the original, it just glares at you, but you can see it here in the English. Verse 9 again. Notice what's emphasized. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. Whose work is it? Oh, it's God's work. He brings the growth. He does the work. It wasn't John Piper's passionate preaching. It wasn't R.C. Sproul's tight logic or even MacArthur's clear outline. It was God working through His servants as He's prone to do. Why? Because He's a merciful God who loves to overturn dead spiritual hearts and make them alive in Christ. But you understand that is a work that no human has the power to do. It's His work, not ours. And so what does all that mean for us? If God's the one causing the growth, what does that mean for us? Well, I'm going to give you three implications of this. Three things that it means for us. First, kind of the theme we've seen, don't give human instruments so much credit then. Why? Because it's dangerous, and I want to give you two dangerous with this. In the first place, if we so idolize a particular pastor or teacher or women's conference speaker or whatever, we, we tend to turn off our discernment. And we stop considering critically the things they say by the Word of God, which, here's the danger, it makes us susceptible to error. We, we follow them, whatever they say, hook, line, and sinker. Or worse, we start to excuse their errors. We start to excuse even their transgressions. Sadly, we can even overlook them. Why? Because we think the church's success rides on the person and not God. That's the first danger. But the second, the one we've already talked about, is tribalism. That factious attitude 
because that will invariably, invariably split the church. Again, who's the center of the church? Christ is. May he never lose center. So that's first. Don't give human instruments so much credit. But second, don't then, if God's the one doing the work, don't over, excuse me, don't overestimate your lack of giftedness. I said that the way I meant to say it. Don't overestimate your lack of giftedness. There are some here that are just like spiritual Eeyores. There's the, I can't do anything right. Nobody will listen to me if I speak about Jesus. And nobody would probably want to if you do with that tone of voice. But God's the one who causes the growth. It's not you. So in a way, it's kind of like get over yourself. God's the one who can work through even you. That's why he called you to himself. So what does that mean? You just probably need to open your mouth more than you do. In the church and out. More to say about that, but for time, I want to emphasize this. So don't, don't give human instruments too much credit. Don't overestimate your lack of giftedness. It's about God doing the work through you to do spiritual good to others. But then third, I just think this means we cannot fail to pray. We must pray. We must be people of prayer. If it's really more of God's work, if He is the one who causes the growth, shouldn't we ask Him for this? And what does that mean but prayer? E even the clearest, most faithful sermons or Bible lessons that are perfectly alliterated or well-balanced, like this one is, wouldn't you know? But anyway, that will do nothing in the person's heart without God. Nothing. So we got to ask God, would you work in us? Did you praise you came into worship this morning? Asking, God, I need your help. You're asking expectantly, God, would you do work? Were you praying for your brothers and sisters that they would be ready in their hearts to hear the word? Are, are you unceasingly praying for, for those you share the gospel with and have yet to believe? Like even our family members. But get this, like conscript others to join you in prayer. I know this happens here. I love it. Talking with a brother. He's been praying for another brother's unbelieving wife for a long time. We don't have to do this battle alone, and we have access to talk to the one who can actually do something about it, the Lord in heaven. There's no greater way to communicate, I think, our dependence upon him at times than to stop working, stop plotting, stop scheming, and you just got to start asking. And that's why it's true. Every elders meeting that we meet, we meet once a week on Tuesdays. We get all together, and we talk as shepherds about the text being preached. But we pray, and we pray for this moment right here, right now. God, do a work. Two, I know the prayer class on Wednesday night as they gather to pray for the church. They always pray for the sermon, for this time to gather corporately as the church. And there's even a small group that gathers on Sunday mornings, 8 a.m. in the conference room, typically, with Jim Walker imitating Spurgeon's boiler room, knowing that as even gifted as Spurgeon was, he's like, I need people praying if God's going to do anything. And we need the same here, even far more so, I think. So if you want to pray, I want to introduce you to Jim Walker. He happens not to be here this morning because he's, I think, traveling. But we'll see him soon. Come see me after service. I will show you where the conference room is. He would love to meet you there next week. But the point is, nothing's going to happen if we're not praying. Because what are we asking? We're asking God, Him to do something that we could never do. With all of our teaching, all of our exposition, all of our Greek and Hebrew, we could never change the heart to glorify Jesus. And I suggest to you, I'm not sure there can be a more obvious look of spiritual health, spiritual maturity, than when we're actually a praying people. Because then our focus is on Him, not us. So let's do that even now as we pray. Asking Him. Make us spiritually mature, settled on Him. And as I pray, I'm going to ask the men who have already been designated to come forward and help us distribute the elements as we come to this table. Let's pray together. 
Father, we thank you that you are merciful. Oh, what a grace it is that you are intimately involved, O oh God, in our lives. And that by your Holy Spirit, you're giving us understanding into the gospel. Uh, by your Holy Spirit, you're even bringing conviction of sin. Forgive us for any kind of factious thought or attitude that's welling up in our hearts. Help us to squash it. Help us to confess that. Help us to unite around this cross pictured for us in this bread and juice. For we are nothing without your mercy at the cross. We thank you for showing us this. Help us to be humbled, to be assured in Christ, and to walk in it. And it's for the glory of Jesus we pray. Amen.